Um, welcome once again to the Economy and Society virtual lecture series and um, I'm really delighted to welcome to the series uh, Professor Arpad Sakhalsai, Professor of Sociology in uh, UCC uh, for this uh, 20 years and who's going to talk to us today about uh, fair ground capitalism. I think he's now Professor Emeritus as he's, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, avoid, avoiding the uh, quite wisely the, the, the chaos of teaching online uh, permanently and all the time and, and, and to, to focus on writing. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's really great to have Arpad here um, to uh, begin to think of theorizing these things uh, um, that we're talking about in often too, too, too broken up or fragmented away and this, this, this over, over, um, overly specialized sort of, sort of way sometimes. Uh, getting lost in the weeds and not seeing the wood for the trees. So we have this very interesting uh, concept from Arpad, um, uh, fairground capitalism. So I suppose I'm going to interview Arpad for about 20 minutes, uh, and just talk through some of these things with him and then open the floor up to questions. So put questions or uh, into the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask a question. But so, um, but to kick off, to get on, get on with things now, um, Arpad, how are you doing? And could you tell us about your idea of fairground capitalism? Thank you, Tom. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so the the idea of fairground capitalism or fairground economy, I now tend to call it better as fairground uh, economy. Um, uh, but it's, it's it's partly a question of terminology, but it's partly a question of. Uh, of really understanding what the, the, the economy is or what we mean by something which, which seems self-evident and which seems to be the center of our life everywhere, and which is the, the economy. Now, actually, uh, you know, before I retired as professor of sociology, or before I even was, became a professor and a lecturer of sociology, whatever, I actually was an economist. I was trained as an economist. I even have a PhD. Uh, in economics, which um, I didn't tell all the time, just to how to say, not not to confuse people. But uh, so that that was my background for many and rather evident reasons that I don't want to go into. But at any rate, um, since I studied economy or started to study economy, which was now almost uh, you know whatever forty five or so years ago, um, or, or since then um, I was trying to understand what we really mean by 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 the economy, which was partly, of course, that I studied economics in Hungary and then it was uh, you know the communism and socialism and all these kind of things, and so I you know on, on spare time and libraries I looked into what economics is in terms of. Uh, whatever you call it, capitalist economy, uh, Samuel Zone, textbooks and economics. Um, and that was one of the, the first of these kind of experiences where I was uh, really um, very astonished because I found that, you know, because you know, coming out of communism and being a kind of absolute staunch opponent due to family and other reasons of communism and all, all sorts of Marxism, so I read uh, Western economic theory and I found it, uh, you know, really difficult, not difficult to understand in the sense to understand what they say, but really, you know, what it is about or what they mean by the economy or why, why is it so self-evident or what, what, is a, what is a market? And, uh, you know, I, I was stuck at first by, or not, I don't know whether at first, but certainly in, in the book of Samuelson, which any of you have ever read, I mean, Samuelson, it goes back to the 1940s, I think, and it's the, the standard economics textbooks and by now it has over 40 or 50 editions and whatever and it says that uh, you know, one of its quotations says that uh, uh, economics is very easy if, even a parrot can be you know taught what economics is you only have to learn what is de demand and supply and said okay well that's fine as a kind of quip but you know, is it is it really so or and then you know, if, if you look into economic theory they don't really say much more than that and so to cut a long story short, uh, I was trying to understand really what uh, economics is really and uh, what it means that economists say that, you know, it's, assumptions don't matter, the assumptions are not realistic uh, insofar as the theory works. Uh, and so again, to cut a short story long, um, I, I now realize after you know, 40 or 50 years or whatever that the entire economy is just, just a trick. Mm. It's a trick, it works, but many tricks work. And that's why I, came into trickster economy and fairground economy. And the fairground is basically the put and the origo in an Nietzschean term, the, the origin of, of the economy. So this entire thing which we 
can't call as an economy, and which you can see some images there. One of the images was cut from the previous image. I don't know, Tom will tell you why, but anyway, maybe he'll bring it out, out of his head soon. But it's, it's just a, simply a trickster trick. We live in a trickster economy, and this trickster economy is transforming uh, all of our world into a trickster land and all of us into tricksters. So it's a very simple thing. If you are willing to become a trickster and play and live like a trickster, then you will be fine. Mm. Uh, if you don't succeed or you are unwilling, then you will be increasingly uh, marginalized. But it's not an issue. So Marxism is completely wrong. And you know, it's, you know, neoclassical economic theory is just a joke. It's just a trick. But, and Marxism got it completely, completely wrong at every single level. So that, that's basically the starting point. You swipe away anything which you ever read about economics and try to understand really what is this madness in which we are living. So to to, to take up that point uh, in, in in more in, in more depth, this thing of this thing, the economy. You you uh, we have these readings circulated, and you make this important point that the economy comes from oikos nomos from the Greek, and this means you know uh, nomos is. Um, you know, an order or a way of being or, or you know, and it's to say the economy is a thing, well then, you know, the, the difference between a thing and a discourse a th or a thing and a norm to say that it is, so that this uh, a sort of whole, a wholesale confusion of, of a good way of being within a household and then this, uh, this, this fairground, this carnival market that we, that we see here. Could you talk about that? Yes, I mean, that's a good example. And, you know, the basic point is that anywhere you turn really into the economy, then you find a paradox, a, a lie, a trick, a confusion, everything, every single thing. And I, I studied economics and economic theory and economic history again for, for four or five. Everything is just, nothing is in the right place. So economists claim that their founding figure is Aristotle. I mean, they claimed it a hundred years ago because now they don't care about that because now all they care about is the, you know, whatever their theories and, you know, real economists no longer even consider reality. I mean, they are running computer programs. And if you want to write now a PhD in economics, not now, but back to 20, 30 years ago. I mean, when I was in Florence, that was, uh, which uh, you know, a few people I, I, I met there, that was their, their problem that, look, I came to study economics, but all they want, uh, is to run a program on, a, on an imaginary population and to see how the, you know, you, you fiddle around with the coefficients and how, what would happen. And they said, you know, what, what is it? But they probably were, uh, didn't realize that that's all what economics is now about. Um, but anyway, so going back, no, no, economics, um, economists no longer care about Aristotle, but that's how the entire trick was institutionalized. Uh, academically that you know Aristotle was the first economist and I just want to point it out that uh, you know that's uh, that's uh, that's a kind of absolute nonsense because because at every level if you look into that that oikonomia didn't mean the economy and that is you know literally our word economy etymologically comes out of oikonomia it didn't mean the economy but it mean meant a particular kind of set of rules for a head of household that's why for example in economics talks about heads of households now if any of you ever studied economics then you know that all of this is about basically individual pleasure and preference and everything like that but economists say no 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 it's all about head of households and the utility so what economists say about utility that's pleasure so that's a coded word they don't talk about utility that's an aristotelian word which somehow stayed there and became invested with a completely different kind of uh, meaning. That is a fairground illusionist. So all economists are basically fairground illusionists by profession, meaning that they take up a word and twist it around and at the end, you know, justify something. Uh, and this is, our, this is our life. But then now it is our life. So now they go and run their po computer programs. And this, is now want, uh, this is what they want now sociologists and political scientists to do. I mean, in politics, rational choice theory uh, took over, you know, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. which is another, you know, amazing story. And now they, do, they want to do it uh, in, in sociology. If you look into Dublin, insofar as I understand, now they have a kind of computer scientist running the, the Dublin uh, department. Uh, in economics, for example, when I was in the US in the 1980s, uh, then I was told that the most successful can candidates in economics PhD programs were, you know, from aerospace engineering. 
So you had a BA in aerospace engineering, and then um, you know you weren't good enough to go and run into NASA. Then you joined economics, and then you continued to run the same kind of programs, not at the same level, but you know. And, and then if you were a social scientist, then you're like, no way, or what do you want in economics? It's just it's just modeling, simulations, and all of that. So this is the importance of history in all, in, in all of your work, in that um, this idea of that there being an economy separate from society makes makes absolutely no sense and is an anachronistic imposition to say there was always an economy or something like this. This idea that you are presenting is much more like the fairground economy or the fairground market or the fairground capitalism almost parasitically sort of emerges in the modern world, um, transforming all, all of our lives in different ways. And now it's almost impossible to escape, but it's the importance of, of, of a long historical uh, perspective rather than to, to, to start at ground zero. Um, yeah, the, the word parasite is very important. I mean, that's why we can turn to, to, to Michel Serre, who wrote this book on the parasite uh, about 40 years ago, and an extremely important book by, uh, by a very important uh, social theorist who, you know, just died, uh, I think, last year, uh, Michel Serre. And his, his book on the parasite is about, uh, about exchange um, and, and the economy. And uh, um, it's very helpful in terms of identifying the parasitical components of all that. Again, going back to the, the economy and this idea that, um, you know, you know Everywhere and always there was an economy. Again, just to move back to, to Marx, I mean, the nonsense of Marx is that all societies in the world were based on a class struggle, mm -hmm. which is an, another kind of nonsense because what is meant by class and class struggle, they're not trivial things. But similarly, now economists and economics and Marx, I put them in parallel. I mean, they are two sides of the same process. Um, economists say that, you know, there was always an economy and people always had an economy and it's trivial. And it's, uh, it's trivial enough to, there was no economy whatsoever before the 16th or 17th century, there was just no economy. And uh, the best, the most important economic historian, I think of the 20th century, Fernand Brodel, basically says as much like that. It's interesting that I talk now with economic historians and now they are uh, marking their distance from Brodel. Mm. Of course, because now Brodel is, is too, uh, I don't know how to put it, too, too interesting and too, too relevant for that. Now, Brodel didn't go as far as to um, you know, deny the economy, but Brodel was talking about three different kinds of realms. But it's the, the same thing, basically, to say that until the, again, until the, the 17th century or so, I mean, what we mean by historical time, of course, it's a kind of very murky process. It's difficult to, to give it a date, you know, as we can give a date to the French, a date to the French Revolution and, um, and, and, and so on. <clears throat> but the major, major point of Brodel is that uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, and then in any kind of society, uh, in a different kind of way, in the Middle Ages there was, uh, you know, local subsistence pro production, then they were local markets, and uh, subsistence production not even local, so to be everybody. Then they were local markets, and then they were international trade. And what Brodel said is that these three were sort of quite different realms, which hardly ever met. Now, my addition here is that well, they actually met in the late Renaissance fairs, and that's why we live in a fairground economy because the fair, the fairgrounds increasingly integrated all of that. And the, the main hair of the Renaissance fair that is the stock market. Mm -hmm. So uh, economists talk about markets, but that's another trickster word because then economists claim, well, there were markets all the time, not true. And then these markets became bigger and bigger and more and more efficient, not true. And then eventually we have the modern market economy. That's a fairy tale story, nonsense, lie, ideology, you, you name it. No, mm -hmm. they were markets not all the time because you know there were some places and there were markets in other places there were no markets. And then, you know, the, the, the history is an enormous thing. We cannot tell the story of, of history in that, in the way economists mm -hmm. claim to tell. Uh, uh, but the point is that what we have as the economy grew out of the fairs, not, not out of markets. Yeah. And you know, it's amazing, I, I couldn't get even good economic sociologists, uh, you know, take up on that. You know, who cares about that? Now we have markets and so on. I, I think it's very, very fundamental. Anything you read in economics textbooks is, is either a kind of triviality related to contemporary exchange, and it's just factually and absolutely untrue.
Hmm. It's interesting what you, I mean, there's the, there's um, two kinds of problems here. There's, there's sort of the lie and, the, and, 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 and untruth and the triviality, but also, so those are things that maybe we're all relatively attuned to. But then you also are talking about uh, trickster logics or something like this, the way in which, and, and this is the importance of anthropological figures like the trickster. And maybe you should say a little bit about this idea of the trickster. It's at the center of your new book, but the, the way in which this is, you know, these are these are, are, are ways of life or ways of being that perhaps they're started by particular tricksters. We don't know, charlatans, mountebacks, um, uh, uh, fairground hucksters of, of various sorts, but in a way, what, what you suggest is that, that this infiltrates insidiously throughout uh, throughout everyday life. So, so markets and fairgrounds turn us into tricksters. Um, and then also, secondly, again, economics is a sort of trickster logic with this. Everybody demands, you know, we have, we have these, you have these great examples of these absurdities. So could you talk a bit about uh, the way in which the market uh, invites us and, and, and reconstitutes us as tricksters or reconstitutes... Um, um, the word. Thank you, Tom. Well, uh, the, the trickster logic is much, um, much larger than, than, than merely e economics. I mean, the, the book, in fact, uh, that chapter, which I sent in a, in a very draft form, and so I have to ask everybody to realize that that was just, uh, I'm, I'm not corrected that in, uh, so basically just um, errors and all this sort of things and shortenings, but, but that was just a draft. Uh, it, it, um, it contains other chapters about trickster politics, trickster art, trickster, um, trickster thinking, and, and, and at the end, trickster society. And what does it mean that, um, that we are being transformed and casualed into uh, follow a kind of trickster logic? Uh, tricksters and trickster logic is not, uh, not the same thing. There are trickster figures and they can be identified in anthropology and mythology and so on. And there is a kind of trickster logic, which is the way in which uh, uh, tricksters behave um, and which is embodied in economic theory in a particular creed way, but not only in economic theory. Now, going back to the trickster, uh, the trickster is one of those uh, very fundamental concepts which are taken from anthropology, which I called uh, with, with Björn in our book as, as, as maverick uh, anthropologists. Uh, what it means is that anthropologists uh, developed a number of concepts uh, sort of outside the central framework of uh, of modern uh, uh, social theory, um, which uh, provide a unique set of tools really to understand uh, our, our reality. And what is amazing that almost all of these concepts were marginalized even within, uh, within anthropology, like liminality, like trickster, like imitation, schismogenesis, gift relations, participation. These are the, the three uh, key terms. And I would say that these are the fundamental terms for under understanding. I'm, I'm not, not joking. So these are the fundamental. You can forget about you know, Kant and Hegel and Marx and, and modern rationalistic philosophy. Modern rationalistic philosophy is itself a kind of trickster trick. Uh, Michel Serres says, uh, says that about Descartes, for example. So what does it mean that you know, Descartes, you know, um, do I really exist? Or what does it mean that, you know, Descartes' question? And Serre says that that's, that's a theater and that's nonsensical. And so I'm not alone to say that, but mm -hmm. Serre is not using uh, the anthropological term because the problem is that even anthropologists for, for many, many decades didn't use these terms because Boas and Durkheim and their students, uh, Radcliffe Brown and Levi Strauss and so on, all marginalize these concepts. So we have to use anthropological concepts, which were systematically eliminated even from the history of anthropology. This is a quite an amazing thing. And so it's not just economics, which follows a trickster logic, but modern economic life follows a trickster logic. Um, and we have to try to understand it. It's a quite, a, uh, how to say, it, bewildering task. But on the other hand, it, 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 it means that you know, it's, it's very important what we are doing because because you know, what is happening now and what we you know, all experience in education, what we see in, <clears throat> in, in, in the COVID kind of madness is, a, is, is, is really a kind of effort of a trickster logic, some actual tricksters, but of a trickster logic simply to, to take over of our entire life. So for example, COVID, you can very well understand through Foucault, you can understand this through Camus, but if you turn to Kant and Hegel and Habermas and the entire you know, group of you know, 
contemporary mainstream European thinker, you know, they tell you get vaccination and something like that, and then it all will go well. No, no, it, 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 it isn't. It's a, it's a very, very scary kind of <clears throat> event. If I can uh, increase the Fairground economy logic even more, I would say that um, uh, what, what we live through in one form as a kind of neoliberal globalization, in a similar form, as Europeanization uh, propagated by Brussels is a kind of another kind of Sovietization, or you can turn it further. There's no real difference between these, and this is this is amazing. This is just amazing. I mean, look look at the, the terminology of five-year plans. The EU are working on five-year plans. UCC is working on the base of five-year plans. Who invented five-year plans? Stalin. Who? Any of you know that? Isn't it Stalin? It's Stalin, yes, Stalin in 1928. Hmm. And you, you go anywhere, and that's, that's a historical fact. Five year plans were invented by Stalin in 1928. The USSR was running by five year plans. And then, um, and then, and then what? And then what, what happens what is that now what we have is a kind of new and improved five year plan. So that's fantastic. It's yeah. new and improved. It's very interesting. I mean, the because... same thing, or, or more or less the same thing. What's sort of fascinating about this is, you know, you're talking about the, the madness of uh, Marxist econom economics in Hungary and the madness of Texas and, and, and astrophysics, and then the madness of Stalin and, and the madness of Brussels or something in the similarity. But this this question of, of the trickster, I mean, in these in these um, in these readings we've been looking at, there's a centrality to the trick of exchanging or exchanging things, substituting things, sacrificing things, and, and that almost anything can be bought and sold is, 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 is sort of maybe one part of it, but it's, it's, it's even more than that. It's sort of like, you know, that um, we could all be treated, I don't know, like uh, economics considers us as, as desiring animals or something like that, you know, reducing us and substituting one desire for another and substituting one product for another. But I mean, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not quite clear on, on the, do, do I understand the full the full trick of the the universal substitutability of everything? Is is this what you're? Well, that, that that's an extremely important by. point, and and you um, you you mentioned the three key words there, which sort of uh, turn into each other as a kind of Möbius strip. You, uh, you all know what is a kind of Möbius strip is, and that is exchange, uh, substitution, and and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, now, here, uh, the, the most important thinker whom I uh, often use is actually Roberto Calasso, who is an Italian thinker and editor. I, I cannot give more details about him. And you know, Roberto Calasso, since uh, you know, 40, 50 years, is trying to understand the connections between uh, the French Revolution as a kind of sacrificial mechanism. Calasso is using a lot of uh, Girard, but he has a quite different idea than Girard's. So it's a French Revolution politics, sacrifice, the connection of sacrifice in terms of you know, modern politics, in terms of you know, Asian and African rituals and spiritualities. Uh, so sacrifice, exchange is exchange, another form of sacrifice. Calasso says that sacrifice is the original and not, not exchange. And the third point is substitutability, which is an extremely important term. So, uh, this is what I now try to you know, explain and understand is what, what, do we, what do we mean by a kind of universal substitutability, because in a certain way that is what underlies this entire logic, this very, very important point of, of markets and, and, and uh, bureaucracy and, and, and manager is more of that. It's, a, uh, it's basically a kind of almost a polar opposition between concreteness and substitutability. <clears throat> so concreteness means that Everything is concrete. Every single um, human being is concrete. Every animal is concrete. Every house is concrete. Every land is concrete. It has its concrete history and terrain and natural components. Everything is concrete and unsubstitutable. This, this is very fundamental. Everybody is unsubstitutable. Now, what the economic and current political logic means, and it is absolutely omnipresent, is that nobody is uh, unsubstitutable. If you look at into the current managerial discourse, that is one of the fundamental elements. Nobody is unsubstitutable. Um, and this is the basis of democracy, because democracy is fully implicated in all of this kind of things. We are all democratic. Nobody is unsubstitutable. Nobody, because unsubstitutability is impl implied as a kind of monopoly. 
which, uh, which at the one hand is another, again, a lie. But then on the other hand, we have a world of complete monopolies, which even in straight economic theory, uh, which I taught, no, sorry, I studied uh, you know, 40 years ago, it makes no sense. We only have monopolies. You know, Amazon is a monopoly. Uh, Facebook is a monopoly. Google is a monopoly. They're all monopolies. They all should be broken up, and yet they are not broken up. It's interesting that there were some kind of uh, uh, mild, uh, meek regulatory attempts to do that. And in my reading, that is part of what is behind uh, this entire COVID kind of madness, because certainly behind COVID is all of these enormous telecommunication companies to uh, reassert their centrality for uh, states and policies and all of that. So now what we have is that this is what I mean by Sovietization is a kind of incredible interplay between sort of global neoliberal market forces, monopolistic telecommunication companies that give simply a lie to anything what economists are saying about reality, but they no longer say anything about reality because you know, monopolies should be illegal. That was the entire basis of modern antitrust legislations and you know, all of the legislation since the late uh, 19th century in terms of controlling monopoly positions. And then to top it off now, it is combined with a strict police state where the uh, internet technologies and surveillance technologies are used and will be used and are certain to be used by the governments. And so it's an it's, it's a incredible uh, quagmire in which we, we got into that. But going back to the trickster, <clears throat> one of the best way to understand that just as we need the concept of liminality, which of course I use since many times, the trickster is a very, very fundamental concept. And the trickster is present in you know, all kinds of anthropological stories, mythologies, religions. Uh, this is why our book with Agnes has the title, The Social uh, the Sociology and Political Anthropology of, of Evil. The trickster is a kind of figure of, we can understand evil through the trickster because evil, we, people think that, well, sure, you know, Hitler is evil and you know, maybe the, Stalin is evil, but apart from that, we are all fine. No, it's uh, the evil is not a dichotomous category in between. You can again identify a few people. I mean, one of the things which is very problematic, for example, right now is that uh, the trickster politics is people understand it, well, okay, sure, that's Trump and, you know, whoever, Orban and uh, no. Uh, you have to be a trickster to enter politics anywhere. Mm. It all requires a trickster logic and trickster techniques and self-promotion. It is not, not, not simply lying, that's too simple, mm. but you know, to, to, to act smoothly, substitutably, to have your friends who are moving up and the moment somebody goes down, then, you know, hello, hello, I, I've never seen you. It's, th th this is what required. And otherwise you are, you know, lost anywhere. Mm. You lost in local politics, not to mention national, not to mention international, not to mention Davos again, which few people know about, but it's, uh, you know, if people talk about that, you know, it's, it's so nasty to talk about, you know, conspiracy theories. But first of all, conspiracy theory is a trick. The idea of conspiracy theory is a trick. The second is that all these, you know, foundations and, you know, research funds to uh, dismiss conspiracy theories is that, you know, that sure, it's not, it's, it's much more, trickful than a simple conspiracy, but, you know, what, what is Davos? I mean, who is in there in Davos? And, you know, is it a conspiracy theory to say that, you know, these, these people in Davos are, are not deciding about our future and they want to, you know, infuse humans with machines and, and all of these kind of things. And, you know, Bill Gates submitted in 2017 a plan which is basically what they are activating in COVID. So is it conspiracy theory? No, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a plain fact. Conspiracy theory is just another trick by which our kind, you know, Kantian, Hegelian, Marxist, Habermasian intellectuals say that, you know, all is fine, you just follow Brussels and the public sphere and so on, and everything is in the hand of democratically elected governments. So it's a problematic on its own, but it's much worse than that. I mean, we, we don't know, it's, it's the many-headed hydra, mm. many-headed hydra, you know, you cut a head and you get two other heads. So you get another um, head, and you get three more. Um, I, I'll just ask one more question, and then we'll open to the to, to, to the floor because I don't want to hog uh, the, the the discussion. And it's already half past. Um, but I mean, what, what you're identifying here is it's it's not just simply you know some simple battle of good versus evil. You know, good democratic um, public sphere, um, individual liberal. 
uh, or something on, on, on one hand and on the other hand, you know, populist right wing, but it's, it's, it's more a problem of, of, of tricksters and trickster processes unrecognized in the economy in society in the public sphere in personal politics and all that. How can, how can we, what, what, how can we go about recognizing what is going on? What sort of, what sort of, um, what sort of guides or uh, would you suggest to people to follow in order to uh, in order to better recognize the the, the 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 strange world we live in? Well, it's a it's a it's a very good question, and it's actually uh, the chapter which I sent you is from part two of the book uh, about the you know, trickster economy and so, 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 and so on. But part one of the book is about guides to trickster land. So in fact, we need uh, we need guides. And that is you know, part of the problem that uh, we are systematically being uh, misguided by you know, false educators and false prophets, which themselves in some kind of way are, are um, spreading contagious trickster logic. So it's, it, 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 it's in fact a, a kind of very, very delicate, uh, very delicate situation because uh, but first of all, absolutely, you, you cannot say that, you know, who are the good Democrats and who are the bad evil guys who are, you know, conspiring. Like that, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. But we have been, uh, since a very long time, uh, uh, quite systematically being mistrained and miseducated. But I'm not alone. The, the, the thing is that there are many people who were realizing that in the past, and there are all kinds of guides that one can, one can find and use. I mean, in my book, uh, I use several seven guides to fix a land, which is quite a lot and quite an you know, interesting group, group of people. Some of them are novelists. There's just, there's just uh, some examples like Albert Camus, for example. Camus is very interesting. And uh, Hermann Broch, or Kalas, who I already mentioned, or, or Michel Serre. But of course, uh, there are a number of other uh, guides, uh, whether they belong to the Nietzschean kind of um, uh, you know, historical sociology or, or whatever you call it, genealogy. There are a lot, lot of people who were uh, realizing that and who had uh, evident uh, premonitions about this uh, uh, terrible situation in which we are heading into, Max Weber, Marcel Mons, and so on. But somehow um, the trickster logic, uh, because it has not been identified, just as liminality has not been identified. So liminality is, of course, fundamental because liminality is central to understand historical processes. Uh, the, the entire, uh, um, you know, linear progressive evolutionist history is nonsensical, and it is absolutely taken for granted, and it evidently goes against historical facts. You know how all of these logics are are perpetuated, but they are perpetuated not just by you know some sort of evil guys and you know communists and whatever so you can remember. They are perpetuated in almost any sociology and history and political science uh, department in the name of Hegel and Marx and Kant and Durkheim. And this is what we are all educated in. But yet there are a huge number of, of people who somehow must be, you know, not, must be brought together. But there is one uh, last thing I want to say, it's very simple. And this is that, uh, you know, that's a very complex uh, intellectual undertaking, think, but the most important thing is, is concreteness. The most important thing is that, that the concreteness is, is a value of anybody and everybody. And concreteness means, uh, um, a kind of faithfulness to what we are, which of course in the contemporary um, landscape, we are all moved around and shifted around and in academic life, that's almost uh, inevitable, but we must, must keep our feet on the ground. We, we shouldn't enter this logic of infinite substitutability. So there is a, in fact, there is, there is a, there is a question about, uh, you know, joining or, or, or not joining, which is the same, same thing. It's a, it's a it's similar thing than, you know, did you join the Communist Party or, or not when you were in the 1960s and 70s? Or I don't know whether you are in Egypt or Iran or whatever. Do you go with the mullahs and, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing right now. So we have to, and, and, and the good thing is that it, it was even possible under communism of, of not, not joining. You just jo didn't join and you, you know, of course, I was in a late part and it was much difficult for people 20 years early, but I knew people who, who even then said no. And they didn't just say no, but they said no to something which was radically corrupt and trickster like. And then they went ahead and did, it, uh, they, they, they did something. Not many, but they did. And th this is always open for us. And for that, we just have to uh, appreciate all our, our concreteness, our language, our culture, our family, 
or whom, uh, and then, then you can you know, build up something. So there is an enormous intellectual task that which many people, I've already mentioned quite a lot, were, were working on that. Mm -hmm. so not, not modernity is hopeless, but there is life beyond modernity. It's a great hopeful note to, uh, to finish on. So thanks, thanks very much uh, for all of this. Um, so just opening up to the, to the floor for questions, put up your hand or else type into the chat if you have a problem with the microphone, we'll try to get around uh, to everybody. Um, so first of all, uh, Ray Griffin, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I do. And, uh, hi, hi Arvad, it's lovely to see you and uh, congratulations on making it out alive before uh, we ended up uh, in this inert kind of uh, cyberspace and congrats on your retirement. Um, it's a, the, I really enjoyed the chapter. It's a really fascinating thesis. Uh, it's, it's very, very provoking. Um, you do a really, really good job of denaturalizing the economy and, you know, bringing us back to, you know, thinking about... Um, other ways and other possibilities. And it kind of bookends very nicely with um, the contemporary thesis of kind of neoliberalism and, you know, the, um, the Fukuyama thesis uh, of, of the end of history and the homogeneity of the economy. And, you know, where, where, where this uh, diversity started to end. Um, I, I kind of have two Two kind of questions for you or two kind of comments. One is um, how do you relate um, politics to to the economy? And just to tease that out a little bit more, so um, in, in the contemporary uh, era we think of politics captured by the economy mm. and Bill Clinton's line, it's the economy stupid. Um, and that the, the fortunes of politicians rise or fall uh, based on keeping the carnival uh, entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, it, it misses out on a more authoritarian view of politics, the kind of Schmittian um, view of politics, which you, which you mentioned a few times. So I just love if you'd say something a little bit about that. Um, yeah, maybe that's enough. Sorry, thanks. Okay, yes. Well, um, thank you so much. It's, uh, um, let me just make a comment first that I'm actually denaturalizing the economy. That's a good point. But I'm also, if, if you want, the, the flip side is that I'm renaturalizing nature um, in, in the sense. And that's, uh, that, uh, for example, con social constructivism is very important. Social constructivism is a main ally of, uh, of this uh, infinite regime of substitutability. This is again, but again, sociologists don't realize. They talk about that. They say that you know they are great guys because they are not social constructivists and not positivists. But that's the same thing. Nature is not socially constructed. That that is a nonsense. Nature is nature. This is nature, and nature is uh, fighting back in its own way. That's the global warming. So I'm renaturalizing. So when I denaturalize the economy, I'm not saying that everything is a construct. No. Communities are not constructs, memories are not constructs, we are not constructs, nature is not constructs. Constructionism is, is one of the worst ideology of neoliberalism, if you want, or you can put it in the other way. Neoliberalism is an ideology of constructivism. Now, going back to politics, uh, just very quickly, um, uh, first of all, the link between economics and politics in a con contemporary sense is, of course, substitutability, as I already said that, and it has to do with the the, the idea of a mass, and the mass is a tricky word because mass means uh, many things, but now I'm talking about the crowd and the mass. Now, um, I didn't have enough time to talk about the fairground, but I wrote about that in the draft because uh, central to the fairs, the fairgrounds, is that these are crowd events, mass or crowd events, and they are uh, an efficient way of transforming people or whatever it is into a, a, a mass which of course was uh, much discussed by the 1930s uh, mass society theories by uh, Heidegger and uh, Karl Mannheim and uh, Ortega y Gasset and so on, and who are now getting a kind of bad uh, publicity through the Habermas and another kind of nonsensical public sphere theorists who say that, no, no, it's the public sphere and it's open and democratic. No, 
they were absolutely right that the mass is, uh, is a main enemy, massification. And it's, it has nothing to do with democracy or whatever you mean by that, that's, a, that's an issue, because uh, you know, human beings are not a mass. But the moment in which human beings are sort of cajoled into the a mass, and of course, this is what Facebook is doing. It's another form of uh, massification, except that now it is uh, um, virtual and it doesn't require a physical presence. That's, that's quite interesting how sort of crowd, uh, crowdification or massification was done by these large, uh, you know, football stadiums and people. I mean, not everybody's closed into, uh, you know, through internet and, and so on into our own shell. And this is how now we are massified. This is why, again, Foucault is so interesting because Foucault's panopticon is, you know, that's the, the best way or, uh, to understand all of these things which are not happening with us. And of course, Foucault was living, you know, 30 years or whatever before the, or died before the, the internet even came. So that, that's a connection because once you have a mass, you have substitutability and you have competition. I mean, another pernicious word, everybody's competing against uh, uh, everybody else and brought into the open market in which, you know, basically everything becomes a kind of infinite game of competition and substitution and substitutability, which is also an infinite game of sacrificial carnival. Because sacrifices all around there, sacrifices the unemployment, and you know, Tom knows, I mean, you know more about that, uh, certainly, but it's also the, the political game of, of sacrificial victimhood when the media is looking for always another kind of victim, where is there a celebrity or a politician who can be sort of nailed down because of an illegal, whatever, an affair or corruption or something like that. And of course, the system works in a way that you cannot keep the rules. That's also a long story and a very, very good books about it. You cannot keep the rules. Everybody has something behind because, you know, you just cannot follow all the rules which are there all the time. And so the system, meaning they can, can always catch you. And it's just a question of who is getting out something about somebody else. What did you say in your high school? Or, you know, did, did you make a, a false move against a girl when you were 16? I'm sorry about that. But it's, you know, who, who, who didn't do something like that? And so they bring it out and then another sacrificial victim. And the system is great because now people think that how fantastic it is. We are not really democratic because this, uh, you know, president or whatever banker or football star is now nailed down. So it's a gigantic mass substitutability and sacrificial carnival. And it is absolutely terrible. And the more people, you know, cry for democracy, the worse it becomes because democracy is no solution. Not just the market, but democracy is no solution, as we understand it. Okay, excellent. I've, I've, uh, I have a list of people to get round to for questions. I promise to get round to them all. Uh, Katrina, you hold. Thank you. And um, thank you very much for that bracing presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about your um, views on the what you call the COVID madness, and particularly the ways in which it lays bare our frightening enmeshment with our technological processes. And it may be it, how you see the connection between these radical monopolies. I think that's Ivan Illich's term, and I think it really fits with what you're saying about the monopolies of the telecommunications mm. um, giants and the way in which they're really actively reconstituting our whole way of being in the world and of interacting with each other. And that COVID has been used to accelerate that process in a very, very alarming way. And we should be very wary of embracing it in the educational setting, which is a tendency I, I, I see. Um, so that we're at a moment in which things that would have been prostheses, you know, our, our phones, our devices actually become um, a, a relationship of prosthesis becomes one of substitution. And, and that's what COVID, I mean, how do you connect that to the COVID madness? And what else do you mean when you say COVID madness? Because it's, it's quite a big area um, that I think could help us to grasp um, some of your ideas. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I want to be very short in a certain way because I actually am at the moment, I'm publishing a book in Italian, but I publish it in, in English. Uh, uh, about the COVID in, in last, last April, which gives, uh, I don't want to resume it that because that would go, go very far, but your question is very important. Uh, now, I, I would phrase it in terms of, again, this anthropological terminology which I was using is that the central issue is that this, this COVID thing uh, is certainly a kind of liminal event. And by liminality, I mean, as probably most people know that, you know, something which has come out as a kind of crisis and emergency and so on. And it certainly happens. Now, the, the question is, 
how it is being dealt with. Now, let me again uh, allude back to Foucault, because Foucault developed a very important concept, which is problematization in this regard. And problematization, that is central concept of the last period of Foucault, means that, okay, there is something like a problem, and problem can be any, anything. It can be in a marriage, it can be an earthquake, it can be... So there is a problem, but how it is formulated, that is specific. And the way in which the problem is actually verbally formulated, verbally or dialogically or discursively, that already uh, indicates the answer. So what Foucault says is that the central issue is not how we suggest a solution, but how the problem actually is formulated and how it is used. And I, the, I mean COVID madness simply is that you know, there was some kind of uh, uh, health issue. I would say, and many people say that, not only me, that if you look back into the last 50 years, this is by no means the most important uh, emergency, medically. I mean, there were all kinds of the SARS and uh, whatever, the Hong Kong uh, flu and the swine flu and all this kind of thing. So there were different kind of diseases. And of course, if we go back to the plague or if we go back to the um, Spanish flu, I mean, there's no way in which this can be compared. But what is new is that this uh, health emergency whether minor or not, we don't even know because now the moment in which the governments and you know who did this and why and how you know who were the people behind there and you know Davos and Bill Gates and so we, we, we don't know but somehow they thought that this is the moment to inaugurate and set in motion this kind of uh, you know internet controlled things. So they jumped on it. And that, that's what I call the, the COVID, COVID madness. And uh, you know, I'm no, no longer interested in writing about it because I don't have the information and the time. Uh, only thing I'm saying is that you know, nothing which one reads or hears is acceptable because our governments and the media jumped on it and now they are running after their money. And so therefore everything is totally fake. Fake news came before, but now it has become a kind of uh, how to say it, um, you know, totally fixated into falsehood. And the trickster logic is a way in which one, liminality trickster logic is ways in which one can understand uh, what, the, what is going on and how this is not turned into a kind of new kind of uh, total control. I mean, just one thing I can say about this is that, uh, uh, you know, previous days, you know, we, we should be there in, in, in Blackwater Castle or something like that, not now, but in mayors. This is impossible, everything is impossible. Uh, what you what I get, and you know that's a main source of information in, in, in UCC email, is that now, now you hardly have any more any intellectual talks and discourses. All you get is a, is a kind of managerial uh, kind of discourses about how it will change and you know anything related to, to that. Uh, uh, so it's a, they are taking it over. Now, who are these they? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, the they are, you know, HR and HR experts and publicity specialists and, you know, you name them, bankers. It's, it's very important that, you know, when did a banker lead a major European country? I mean, just give me one name. Now it is, you know, the head of Italy is Draghi, who is a main figure of the Davos issue. The head of Italy is Macron, who was working with Rothschild, both bankers was bankers. But you cannot I then analyze it through a kind of, you know, it's not Marxist capitalism that is going on. Uh, but it's not better. Okay, we could continue this um, and maybe we will someday in some happier day in the sun in the castle. But to move on, uh, I have a question from Amin, Alex, and then Ponti, and a comment from Anya, I think, if we can get to them all. Amin, you next. Yeah, hi, Arpad. Thank you very much, Arpad. It is a comment rather than a question. Just I would like to relate imitation and and the trickster figure uh, to our contemporary world. What's going on? A little bit to to discuss about that. And I, I, I all of us we know already about uh, uh, neoliberalism that. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, they reintroduced it uh, in uh, 1978 uh, and nine, And they started to claim that that is the solution for our uh, current economy and uh, this will prevent neoliberalistic, uh, neoliberalism will uh, 
solve the uh, problems we have, the economic crisis and so on. And uh, they introduced indeed a free market and uh, the free trade. Uh, but what happened after that, the other countries, even I know uh, so-called developing or underdeveloped countries, they started to uh, copy the same system and uh, privatize uh, everything in their country. But from this privatization, only nationally, if you want to think, only uh, we uh, witnessed that uh, poverty uh, was increased and internationally, only uh, rich, country, rich countries, they could benefit from the uh, free trade and uh, free market. Uh, I, I know that in 2017, uh, Jason uh, Hickel, uh, he, he published an article called Aid in Reverse, How Poor Countries Develop uh, Rich Countries. We heard from the media that uh, the rich countries, the US particularly is sending uh, aid and helping uh, 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 countries in Africa, poor countries, so-called uh, developed, underdeveloped and developing countries. Uh, but uh, if uh, you see the article uh, Jason uh, published, uh, you can see that uh, indeed um, they helped, they sent aid, say they sent aid to Africa, uh, and the, the, his research is showing that uh, they send one euro aid, but, but uh, the developing countries uh, received, uh, received one euro, but they, uh, they lost 24 euro in net outflow. That means they helped one euro, but they, they got back uh, 24 times more from uh, the uh, poor countries. And th that is about uh, neoliberalism, uh, very much related to capitalism. Uh, and, and the uh, argument uh, we have here, it is about, about, about liminality. We are left in liminal time that the system they introduced indeed increased poverty, not only nationally, but also internationally. And they don't allow that the, the uh, the incorporation happened. I mean, I'm talking about uh, uh, rights of passage. Uh, uh, we have separation uh, 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 and uh, uh, liminality and the incorporation. We are left in liminality in any stage, not only in economy. I mean, if we, if, if we want to talk about, uh, for example, slavery, what happened with slavery? Okay, we had old slavery, now we have modern slavery. Only they change. Okay, change happened. We don't ignore the change. Change happened and they uh, abolished uh, slavery, but uh, neoliberalism increased uh, modern slavery. And it, it, is, it is about take the figures and the political actors, how they are playing and showing us that everything is fine. Same as I, uh, I talked about uh, uh, aid, they are sending uh, help to other people to other countries and they are claiming on the media that we are helping poor countries, but uh, they are helping one euro and they are getting back uh, 24 euro. So that is, that is one thing. And the other thing is about uh, uh, reincorporation in any state, it, it, about equality, about, about uh, gender equality. They are claiming about gender e equality. We are, we are seeing but gender equality just change and uh, find other shapes, other uh, 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 methods, and then we see that the gender uh, uh, inequality is going to be increased rather than uh, to be uh, decreased. That is uh, what I am talking about. And they are not allowing that the reincorporation stage happen. So we are left in permanent <laughs> liminality or okay. prolonged, at, at least in prolonged liminality. I think that's a, that's a very good point about, uh, you know, what is specific about neoliberalism, because that's indeed a question of, you know, what, what, what we mean by that, apart from that being a slogan in all kinds of ways, but is, is there something specific? And I think there is something specific in, in, in neoliberalism, and that can be very well perceived in, in, in the ideas of Hayek, which were so central for it. And what is specific to neoliberalism in, instead of classical liberalism is an explicit play on permanent liminality. 
Because when we were still in sort of the classical kind of liberal setting, whether it's in a post-war reconstruction and so on, or the you know, Keynesian and other versions, there was still um, a kind of limited vision of, uh, of, of, of the economy and what, what, the, what the economy can do and how sort of markets are helpful, but they must be limited because there was still some idea about um, about social relations and you know political life and, and all this kind of thing. So what is specific about neoliberalism, and in that sense it's an important word, is that in key, in fact this is an ideology of, of permanent liminality. And in this sense, this again the COVID emergency is absolutely used to increase this kind of permanence of an emergency kind of situation. But the liminality doesn't mean simply emergence, but also this kind of infinite exchange and infinite substitutability. This is kind of a, a game of musical chairs in which uh, you know, everybody is forced to play that game and everything is uh, totally interconnected. So I think this is indeed what is specific to neoliberalism uh, in contrast to previous sort of liberal uh, ideas, philosophies, economies. Thank you. So much to discuss and all of that. Um, we have time for two more questions and also just to say if people have to go, we understand if you have to teach um, or, or, or work or something. Um, and also to remind people that next week we have a seminar at 10 on Tuesday and at 10 on Thursday, you'll see on our website, blah, blah, blah. There's my fairground advertisement, right? You know, um, so sorry. Um, let me bring in Alex Wood and then, and then, and then Ponti Ja. Thank Alex, you. Wait, sorry. Yeah, hi. Can I just say thank you for uh, putting this uh, series on, you know, Mech, so it gives an opportunity to kind of be availed to, you know, different types of thought. So thank you for that. So I'm from Birmingham City University, and I'm really struck, Arpad, when, you, when you're talking about, um, you, you talk about models, and you talked about simulations in, in the presentation that you did, and you talked about substitution. And you mentioned Foucault, but that word seems to be, from, from my kind of understanding of, you know, contemporary French theory it seems to be quite close to Virilio in terms of substitution, but also Baudrillard as well. And what I'm always struck by those two writers is that they are often seen as, you know, in scare quotes, conspiracy theorists when they're actually unfolding what is beyond capital and beyond Marxist capital as well. Could you just say a little bit about how you feel that, because I haven't had the, the privilege of reading your chapter, could you just say a little bit more about the way in which you think your work might intersect with perhaps Virilio and Baudrillard? Oh, yes. Uh, well, um, I don't know Virilio enough, I must say. Um, Baudrillard, I, I, I was using uh, quite extensively his ideas about evil and technology in our book on, on evil. And actually, Baudrillard was one of the, you know, the um, sort of background sources uh, uh, for, for that book. Um, uh, and so I can see some, some similarities with, with uh, Baudrillard's ideas. I, and, uh, Baudrillard is very important in terms of his uh, recognition of a certain unrealness of our reality, which is close to, in my reading, Camus on the absurd or, or Kafka. How is it that somehow our very world is turning into a, a kind of unreal world? As far as I understand Baudrillard, I wouldn't go as far in terms of, um, because in, in my reading, and I might not be right, uh, he goes too much into a kind of constructivist or whatever position of saying that, well, really, after all, nothing is, nothing is real or everything is just a kind of illusion, which is increasingly, interestingly, is very close to a kind of Vedic Hinduistic uh, position all is illusion. And in fact, this is what our uh, world brings up. So this is why, for example, Plato is so fundamental. Because Plato's uh, uh, metaphor of the cave is perfectly applicable to us. I mean, we all live now inside the cave and this is where we are now being forced. So going back to COVID, but it doesn't mean that everything is illusion in the kind of Vedic Hinduistic sense that really the world is an illusion and we have to escape it because that I consider as a kind of Gnostic, uh, Gnostic position. So that, that is somehow in my uh, understanding looms a bit in the, in the behind um, Baudrillard, but maybe you don't agree with it, but that's, that's a problem I see in, in Baudrillard. So I want to go back to real. I think the real is real. Concrete is concrete. There are unmediated experiences. Basically the entire 200 years of modern Western rationalist tradition is meaningless because it tries to undermine what is real, what is natural, what is concrete, and what, what is there. And um, you know, it, it, this, is, um, this is being uh, assaulted 
and we have to understand what this assault is, but we should never give up our reality and our sense of judgment and our good faith in, in nature and in, in reality. Not in a kind of romantic illusion, but the very idea of a romantic illusion is also a, a trick. Because what it means is that, uh, you know, it would be sort of, oh, it's just a romantic illusion because really, in fact, nothing is there but, but interests and games and everybody just want more money and more influence and uh, all, of, all of that kind of thing. It's just uh, the, the reiteration of tricks and um, fixating of us in this kind of trickster logic. Okay, thank you. Different with the trickster theories all circulating around. Ponty, la last question, I think, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I find this quite quite interesting. There was so much defamiliarization with concepts and ideas that I thought I know so much about. I mean, talking about the marketplace, talking about the economy. What I find so difficult is that there's this uh, growing schemogenesis that is going on in the in modern market system where uh, humanitarian organizations tend to take, you know, they, they, they tend to be on one side and then other capitalist uh, individuals or companies tend to be on the other side where you see consumers see humanitarian organizations as if they are the ones, you know, they are the social organizations that are coming in to help people, while they see other companies as capitalists that are just there for profit. But when you begin to dig deep into some of these humanitarian organizations, you discover that they are still playing on the same principles, you know, they are still operating on the same principles of making more money, raising more funds from donor agents and companies and organizations. And at the end of the day, when you check how some of these uh, people working in these uh, humanitarian organizations, how they are paid, their well, welfare packages, their salaries, there's nothing different about capitalism. So I'm kind of fixed. I'm kind of in a fix now at the moment. What could be the way out of all this dilemma? What is the future? What do we hope for in terms of the future? When uh, religious institutions have failed and are no longer looked up to, then the humanitarian organizations are tilting towards the same direction of being capitalist in nature or you know, ex trying to exploit, take advantage of people and, and, and get more donor agents and still, you know, have a good welfare package for those who are working in it. What is the way forward for it out of this situation? Yes, uh, thank you very much. That, that, that's, a, that's a very important point because the, the very little I know about international organizations, uh, partly from colleagues, partly simply from people who went there, is also extremely depressing because as, as you say very often uh, these organizations are just as if not more uh, you know corrupt in their own ways of operating as the you know state or other international organizations um no again i mean um I, I cannot of course give a solution to that but i mean a central issue here is is again is to to avoid uh, in any possible ways uh, uh, a subservience to a kind of trickster logic, and the trickster logic means a kind of uh, um, whatever slogans and 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 ways of operation. Fi finding a finding a slogan, whatever is the slogan, NGO, and for example, that that's a, that's a, that's a slogan. So government organizations bad, NGOs they are good because they are outside government. Nonsense. Um, um, it's difficult, of course, to pull or, or to, 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 to move completely outside of, uh, well, not slogans, but outside of any kind of terminology, because any, any tech terminology can be taken up and used uh, to, to its opposite ends. Uh, but um, the, the, the central issue still is that somehow uh, one and anybody anywhere must, uh, must keep uh, one's feet uh, on, on the ground. I can, I can only re repeat that, which meaning uh, for not uh, being, it's, it's very important, being always very suspicious to kind of generalize global ideological aim, but which doesn't mean that one has to be, you know, cynical or saying that it's all, all the same thing, because, um, because if somebody, and it's very important, if somebody trusts one's own sense of judgment, then one knows, okay, that person I can trust. Now that person seemed, you know, quite attractive and whatever, but, but then this is what that person did. So one has to be careful. Um, and in this way, it is possible to, to build up, uh, you know, there was a, a, um, a, it, it was a very famous terminology, which didn't go anywhere anyway, in, in Hungarian politics, which is the small circles of liberty. And this is when one of the political parties started to build up after 89 in Hungary. They, they didn't succeed, I don't know why, because I, I didn't follow it. 
is always just to build on people whom you trust personally. So this is, for example, fundamental for modern politics as against to democracy in the general sense and elections. That uh, you know, any human community can only be built up from not simply from the below, because that's not, not enough, but from, from a kind of mutual trust. And anybody anywhere can find people whom he or she can trust. And if you find people whom you trust, then you can already do something and you can do something more uh, and never never jumping on, on one or of the, the other bandwagon. And then some, something can be done. Something can always be done. But never in terms of uh, slogans, never in terms of finding something which you can then slow around, you know, democracy, openness, civil society, public sphere. Um, the, what, what happened with uh, Facebook is extremely interesting, and this, this uh, sociologist should study. Who were the sociologists who jumped on, on this kind of telecommuni telecommunication machine as, you know, finally democracy will be there? There were many, I know, I know several of them. And there, there you can see how is it, who is, who is that you know, can jump on any of this kind of slogan and therefore is a kind of puppet who can be pulled around by the strings, and who, is, has, who has a concreteness, uh, and who can be trusted and who doesn't uh, you know, sell himself or herself or doesn't become just a tool of, uh, of one or other uh, plans. <clears throat> of course, it's very difficult because the international organizations from funding to all the others are you know, throwing around money to anybody who joins them and who then becomes their own uh, member of their own schemes, but it doesn't have to be done. And, and after all, so I'm talking about Sovietization, but after all, we are still, still in a better position than we, meaning in, in Hungary, were under, under Soviet rule, because then it was then it was really tough. I mean, I could in no way talk something like that to anybody. I mean, I could talk with my friends, you know, but we, we still have a degree of openness. And, and this is terrible that we cannot you know, be on Blackwater Castle. <clears throat> and it's also terrible that we don't know who is actually listening to it because, uh, you know, there are all these kind of guys. I mean, I know somebody, I don't want to go into detail, who was for years, all his Gmail uh, was tracked by a place in Atlanta. Uh, it was possible to track it. And then there was a company behind that. And nobody knew what that company was. I still have this name somewhere. I try to forget. And the moment in which she changed her email password, 10 hours later, she got into, no matter what she did. Hmm. So they are, they, they are out there. And we don't know what is going to happen, but if so far as we can still do that and talk uh, in a class, or in, then, then, then we are not yet fully there in, 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 in uh, Sovietization. I'm sure some people want to do that outside the Soviet Union, which anyway doesn't exist, but, but we can still do something. And even then it was possible to do something. Okay, I mean, um, there's, there's so much more we could talk about, but it is difficult to do it online, but it's, it is so great to have you, Arpad, here in the sort of sense of, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a classroom returns to us where we can talk and trust and, and, and continue these things. So um, it just remains to me to thank everybody very much for coming, for their questions and, uh, and, and to Arpad and to hope, hopefully, that we'll all see each other this time next year in, 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 in a real place. Uh, for a better conversation, more hopefully. So, um, thanks very much, and we'll see anybody who's interested next week uh, uh, for, for the uh, subsequent seminars at 10 o'clock, Tuesday and Thursday, uh, Angus Bancroft and uh, Alex Wood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arpad. Thank you, Arpad. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you.